Okay, welcome everybody who just joined. Our next speaker is Peter Spacek. Um, he is going to have the, a talk that is less focused on the DNS people here and more focused on the other people here. Um, so enjoy. Hello. Um, as this was mentioned, I'm Peter Spacek and work for CZNIC. So if I talk about not resolver in some like fancy way, just don't, don't take it seriously, right? <laughs> Bind is good as well. So uh, the talk is called Blame and DNS. And right now we will be focusing on the thing, how to detect where it is broken, not how to fix it. We have half an hour, so we are not going to fix things, just find what's broken. And that's just enough for half an hour. So. Everybody knows this, it's it's nightmare because it basically says nothing. S something is broken, go figure. And it might be DNS, might be basically anything else. So right now we are focused on DNS and that means that we have to go through some of the basics because to debug something we have to understand how it works in practice. So. This is in the school book. In theory, there is some uh, recursive resolver which contacts the authoritative servers and combines the answer from the pieces scattered all around the net. That's the theory, but that's not the practice at all. Of course, users want to have some application, right? And the application, for example, a Firefox or something, is not talking directly to recursive resolver, typically, but it's using some APIs in the operating system. Then the operating system handles the communication. So there are a couple layers of indirection, but that's still not enough. In practice, the operating system talks to something, be it modem or whatever, your home router or something, and this middle device then talks to recursive server, in theory. In practice, nobody knows. It's like, I mean, this is the reality. It's your operating system attempts to send the packets to some IP address, then magic happens, and you get some packets back. And that's what we need to debug right now. So prepare for fun. Uh, now the difficult question is, what do we do? Because something is broken, where we should start? So this presentation is not like universal procedure for all problems. Take it like high level ideas and modify it as you see fit. So I like to begin with the authoritative end because that's usually, you know, problem, somebody else's problem. So. <laughs> And besides this, it, if you look at the far end, you will have some expected values, the values you want to get to your local machine, which is nice because you have something to compare, something to start with. So, okay, the website doesn't work, and now we want to get the right values, what we should see on our local machine, but local machine doesn't work, right? So to solve this chicken egg, problem, we use some external tool to look from other side of the network, basically. So my favorite tool is called DNSWiz. There is more of them, so you can find alternatives as well. And it's quite an easy web app to use, but quite powerful. I will try live demo, so it doesn't work. Okay, so web page called dnswiz.net, easy as that. And now, how do I work with Mac? Okay. You just enter the domain name, supposedly the one which doesn't work. This one should work, right? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, th this is likely to work because it's run by ICANN and it does nothing, so. Mm. And DNS will eventually come up with some nice graphs. Give it a second. Uh, the thing is that, ah, okay. Mm, it's too big, right? So how do I make it smaller? Come on. Plus or minus. Oh, okay, okay. Awesome. So we can read it now when I get that. Yes. yes. <laughs> Perfect. It looks like this. I, I will zoom up. Or 
maybe you know what? I will switch to slides back because it's more legible than the original one. <laughs> so that's the website. You enter the name, and then there is a couple of things to look out for. First, the DNS Swiss it has its own cache, and it might show you quite an old result. In this example, oh, it's still small, but there is information about the time when the result was generated. And in this case, it's seven days ago, which means useless for debugging. But there is a button which is next to the time. Uh oh. <laughs> if you click to the update now, it should generate a new result, and then you have the thing you need to see. OK, so now let's assume that we have the fresh result from the NSWIS. In that case, the important part of page is called notices. And if you can see a lot of red and yellow signs, then there is a problem on the far end, most likely. So it's in this case, it's a good idea to pick up phone and call the domain owner and say, hey, your site is broken. Do something about it. Because usually, well, often it means that the problem is not local and you are not going to fix it because you have no means to do that. So you need to get, the, for example, the bank, which is always a fun to fix something. If we assume that this left part is green, it means that DNS Swiss didn't find anything broken on the authoritative site. Then we can go to the next step and look for the expected value, the, for the values we should see on the local machine. So if you hover your mouse over some of these bubbles, it, the DNS Swiss will show you the data, for example, the IP address, which is available from the remote server. So that's the value we need to get, basically. So when I debug something, I take a note about this value and then continue with the rest. OK. So now we cover the case when it's broken on the remote side. It means pick up the phone, call the domain owner if you can, and tell him to fix his stuff. Done. If it's not broken on the remote side, then it's a bigger problem for us. So the next step is to debug it locally. We have the value we want, and now we need to find out why it didn't arrive. So, as I've mentioned previously, there is an operating system in play and some middle box devices and some firewall magic. So, first thing to rule out is the local machine, the operating system. If you use ping, it goes through the operating system APIs, and it might happen that something is broken locally and the problem is not even in DNS, because if you use ping and it gives you IP address 12345, oh, that's <laughs> that would be really bad. <laughs> 1234, and the dig, uh, uh, which is utility, which talks to, directly to DNS and basically skips the layers of indirection in the operating system, or some of them, will give you different IP address. It means that the operating system is doing something weird with the answer. Maybe the content of file slash etc slash host is something weird and it prevents resolution. In any case, if the result from ping and dig commands don't agree, it means that it's problem somewhere most likely in the operating system. So don't blame DNS in this case. But if the result from ping and dig commands are the same, it means that the DNS is something uh, returning something weird. Because DNS with says the IP address should be 91, whatever, whatever, and the ping says 1234, and DIC as well. So locally, we are getting different values from DNS than values seen in the DNS with. In that case, it's going to be fun. So next step is typically to open the slash etc slash resolve.conf and look for the IP address, which is the IP address used by the local resolver uh, operating system to talk to the local resolver. There is a couple options. Again, it's 
like big debugging tree. Imagine how many options and how often you need to branch. It's a lot of fun. So if you run the dig command without any, param any extra parameters with the at sign, which specifies IP address, it uses the IP address from slash etc slash resource slash uh, dot conf. <laughs> so now we know where to look. If the resolve conf file says uh, and there is a local host address in it, it means that you are talking to recursive resolver on the local machine. Might be unbound, bind, system be resolved, whatever. The thing is that if it's local, it's easier because you can open the lock, see what ha happens, maybe flush the cache, restart the daemon, see if it helps or not. It might happen that lock doesn't make any sense at all. You see that the local daemon sends the query to the internet and the result, the answer which came back, is just nonsense, doesn't match the query sent and so on. In that case, something fishy happens on the network, most likely. So I often suspect ISP that they mock with the DNS. Some, of course, they have good intentions, but they make our lives much harder. So there is a couple of ways how to confirm this theory or this proof. Uh, so if I go back to the DNS Swiss, you can see the IP address here. That's the expected value f from the remote server. And there are IP addresses of the authoritative servers on the other side of the net. So what we can do is to take address of this authoritative server or any of them and use dig at sign and the IP address from the DNS Swiss and the query as usual, and we can see whether we get the same result or not. If the result is not the same, it means that we attempted to communicate directly with the authoritative server and we got garbage back, which means that something fishy happens on the network. Or if you just didn't ma uh, make the note, my way how to confirm this is to use some garbage IP address at all. For example, this IP address 192.021 is from documentation block, which is by definition not rootable on the internet. So if you get answer for this query, it means that something totally shitty happens on the network. So in that case, pick up phone, call your ISP, tell them, what do you do? I don't want you to do this. And if, you know, usually, you will not succeed, so it's time to change ISP. Uh, there is no other way around because they're just, you know, doing dumb things sometimes. Okay, that was the example when we had local host address in the slash etc slash resolve.conf. It might happen that there is something else, not the local address. Typically, it will be IP address of your home router, modem, something. In that case, go figure where is the configuration interface for the another thing. If it's home modem, you know, open the documentation or something. And hopefully you will be able to find another IP address in that modem. Typically, the modem forwards the queries to the recursive resolver on the ISP. So if you get an IP address of the ISP recursive server, you can skip the modem and see if it helps or not. So, assuming we go to the web interface of the modem, for example, and got an IP address of the ISP's recursive resolver, we can again use dig add IP address of the recursive resolver and name and see if it, if it works. If it works, it means that we basically skipped one piece in the resolution chain, we skipped the modem, and now it works, the modem is the faulty one, right? So uh, the classical trio, you know, C logs, flash cache, restart, if it doesn't help, time to throw modem out of the window or at least call the ISP. If it doesn't work even when you try to contact the ISP's DNS recursive server directly, well, then the ISP has a big problem. Most likely the 
support line is ringing all the day, <laughs> so don't be surprised if they don't answer your call. And again, might be time to change ISP to something more real reliable. Uh, well, it's quite complicated to uh, give some generic procedure because DNS is Wild West. It's like anything can happen. I'm always surprised when I debug something because no matter how many problems I debug, I'm always surprised by something new. So just the high level idea. Don't trust your local machine because that's often the reason why it's broken. So use some looking glass like DNSWiz or SSH somewhere else and run the query from the remote machine from different part of the network. And then there is nothing else than common sense. Just you know, compare what you see, think, okay, we have chain of five components which forward to each other and it looks good at the last three, so one of the first two has to be broken and so on. And besides this, the ultimate recommendation is complain loudly. If DNS is broken at your ISP, don't be silent. You know, you can work around it somehow. You can use DNS over TLS, for example. But it's not helping, or it helps you for the moment, but it's not helping anyone else, because it will stay broken. Other customers who are not so technically savvy will not be able to set the DNS over TLS or anything else, and we will get super creepy experience. So complain loudly, please. Call ISPs, send emails if you can send email at the moment. <laughs> and <laughs> because we need to create push and explain that there is a demand for a you know, sensible internet connection, not just port 443. And if you don't have enough, go to the GitHub. There is a project called DNS Violations which is basically a collection of weird stuff which happens in DNS. And we would be glad if you submit weird stuff you see in your network, because it's always at one hand fun, and on the other hand important information to know what can happen, because we as uh, developers of the DNS software need to know in what conditions the software will work, because I mean, there is 200 RFCs around the uh, DNS. And even if we read all of them, it's not enough because the real, real network doesn't match what's written in the RFC at all. So please complain and share the information. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I think we have like five minutes, right, for questions? So, okay. So, go on. Go on. <laughs> go <wild. laughs> uh, not really a question, but a comment. I also often use DNS quiz, and sometimes, or most of the time, it presents not a single error, but maybe multiple errors, and read all of them, not only the first one, because I was trying, it said it could not find a matching uh, signature for my DS key in the parent zone, and it was. Uh, I ended up uh, manually doing controlling if the signature was correct and all the verification until I found out there was a second error below, could not contact uh, authoritative name server. So, of <laughs> course, he could not find a matching signature because he could not contact the name server. So, really yeah. the error message. Definitely. Please. Um, sometimes in the past, the solution was use the Google DNS 8.8.8.8, right? Would you recommend people to overwrite whenever they have DNS problems and use that? Or well, try to use the DNS server that they should be using? I mean, this <laughs> prevents you from doing that often. Because okay. if the network is doing something fancy with the DNS packets in flight, you can use any IP address you want. It might be 1111 or the documentation address, and you will get the same crap. So, it might be a good debug uh, debugging step. Right? Yeah, you can you can definitely try it. DNS script has been a uh, workaround for a while until it was discontinued. Uh, sorry, once again. DNS script has been a workaround for a while until discontinued. Yeah, DNS script seems to be that. So. DNS would be better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, I have seen some questions somewhere. Go on. Um, 
for debugging, you can also use wipe atlas. Uh, yes, if you have access to Ripe Atlas, sure. But it's open. It's, it's can do it. Oh, really? It's gratis. OK. Good to know. DNS over TLS is a good answer to the one server. Well, yeah, the DNS over TLS has the decent and the, the problem that there is still not yet the public and stable reliable server for it, so sure, sure. it's, sure. <laughs> well, we are looking for, there, is, there are several actually, well, Quad9 is, Quad is the biggest one, it's not official, but very soon it will be, okay. yeah, the problem is that nothing is like, nothing have SLA, nothing have, you know, the stable encryption keys and so on, but hopefully the Quad9, yeah, which is the 9.9.9.9, .9 for, for, you know, equivalent of the Google thingy, except it shouldn't have the transport problem, <laughs> hopefully. Go on. Uh, as, as long as, as you actually have a, a, a good local resolver, it is way better to use that than Google DNS. Because actually Google servers perform better using your local DNS. Because that they, uh, from the authority server, they look at which network does the query come from. Mm -hmm. And if, if it comes from 888, mm -hmm. it comes from Google's network, you get servers within the network. Where if it comes from uh, your ISP's network, then uh, or your own server in the ISP's network, then it, it uh, will send you to Google servers that are close to you. Yeah, there was a comment that the different servers might return different other uh, answers depending on from where you ask. And that's, of course, one complication to debugging because, well, <laughs> if you are getting different answers from different places, then it's hard. But usually when you get the tailored answer, it's the one which should work, right? Because there is some intelligence which is generating the answer, so hopefully that will be the functional one. Okay, oh, go on. Uh, this is already ISC again. Um, I originally started the DNS violations project, and I invite, well, because I don't have uh, much time lately, I invite everybody to come and, and help us with the project. That's one thing. And the, and the second thing, if you ever think of writing DNS server, please go <laughs> read, the, read the current violations that are, that are there, and please don't make the same mistakes. Also don't write your own Pretty please. No. <laughs> <laughs> make new mistakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and if you make new mistakes, go log them on the DNS server. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. <clears throat> so, um, we've seen some customers that are using some uh, CDNs, and they are based on a uh, anycast DNS, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit more difficult to troubleshoot because from your side uh, the DNS answer is different from the customer side uh, depending on yes. the uh, point of asking. So do you have any smart way to... Okay, so the question is how to deal with the tailored answers which depend on the IP address you ask from. and. Do we have some super tool for this? No, it's just complex. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, theoretically, yeah. But also, and I know if you have access, something like that. But uh, why Atlas is the most. But that can't give my palace my IP address. So. It's, yeah, yeah, the problem. Yeah, I mean, we probably don't have anyone from Nominate here, but they have wild stories about having like millions of views because every customer has its own tailored view of DNS. So, I mean, Ripe Atlas definitely might help if you can use it, but. You know, take it. Uh, go. The idea might be used in the, the Tor browser. Oh, well, you can use Tor browser, but then you have no idea where you popped up. <laughs> so you do have an idea. You click on it and you say it says I mean, it doesn't help to debug the particular problem because you will, you, you know, show up somewhere. And if, it, if you try it and it doesn't work for you, but you try it via Tor browser and it works there, then it, that's information. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But basically, we will get similar information from the DNS Swiss, right? It's a different place in the network. If you reach okay. DNS Swiss. <laughs> oh, yeah. DNS Swiss is one place. Tor browser is like a random place, and you can just click a button and get a new random place. Uh, yes. Go on. Um, do, you have, do you know a way to know what Swiss solvers are a process using? Is a process using? Because. Lipsy doesn't update 
mean when the process is oh, yeah. okay yeah the problem is that uh, when usually when you start a process it reads the slash etc slash resolve conf and then it keeps the ip address during the lifetime of the process that's the typical glibc behavior and yeah it's it's madness i use wireshark or tcp dump and look how it looks what it does when i type in something which generates the nsq query to kind of bypass that okay. in, in Ubuntu by default we have a local DNS resolver so you always point at 127.0.0.1.2 and then you always resolve locally and that does update ETC host, it does update the DNS dynamically, it does yes, split DNS and yeah, all that things and flushes caches so it's a, it's a bit dynamic. So the, the that's the uh, WTF. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have those, those things. <laughs> yeah. So like although libc is limited, like most of the distributions, they kind of, you know, have more stuff behind it. Pintos doesn't have it. And EG libc has a patch right? But not, uh, yeah. Yeah. In general, I think that having local resolver is a good thing because you can validate locally and don't need to rely on you know anyone else doing DNS validation for you. <laughs> but then it's more stuff which can break and it's more fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Uh. I will be pretending that I didn't hear this. <laughs> Go on. Uh, one more thing about uh, Ripe Atlas, it used to be that you just could send them in, uh, a mail and you would get sent such a note to uh, use your own connection as, a, as one of the data points for the Ripe network. I'm not sure if it's still so, if they already uh, they, they also had the, the notes here. Mm. Uh, I don't think they have more probes here, I think okay. they run out after, after the, the talk earlier. Was okay. added, but I know that there, there are several people from Ripe that have brought probes here. Yeah. So okay. You, you can fill out a form on the website, yeah, indeed, but also saying. you can you get points regardless of having a probe yourself. Uh, so uh, you can use the network anyhow, and you just just ask them for more more points if you need it, because it's only as a measure to make sure that people don't overload the network. Uh, so if you just need some points for doing whatever measurements, you you just get more points. Okay. So. For the record, if you want to type a class gadget at home because you don't have enough of them, just fill, up, fill in web form on ripe.net and you will get one. <laughs> okay, thank you for your time.